Abbott. What time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure. Chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. All right, all right, Costello. Hey, Abbott! Shut up. Hey, Abbott! Costello, here I am. What are you so excited about? What am I excited about? Yeah. The two motorcycle cops just chased me, chased me up Sunset Boulevard. What, Boulevard. What? Boulevard. What? Boulevard. What for? What for? Yeah. Just because I had the green light with me for six blocks. Well, wait a minute. Now, look, look. If you had the green light with you, why were the cops chasing you? I had it in the back seat of my car. <laughs> You and your whole family are always in trouble with the law. I guess you're right, Abbott. No, I guess you're right. Yes, indeed. During the last war, my brother Pat got arrested because he forgot to register for the draft. He, he forgot to register? Yeah, he was too busy milking his cows. Milking his cow? Mm-hmm. He should have been at the front. What for? The milk was at the other end. Hey. <laughs> you're, a, you're a hopeless idiot, Costello. Oh, please don't say that, Abbott. It isn't my fault. I had a very sad home life. You did? I did. I was born on a streetcar, and I never saw my mother. Why not? Why not? She forgot to get a transfer. <laughs> I'm convinced that you're a schizo. A what so? A schizo. Ski, skis. Haven't you ever experienced a schizo phrenia? Yes, the first time I put on a pair of skis, I fell on my phrenia. <laughs> but don't bore me out, Abbott. I don't feel so good. I went to the doctor, and he told me I was as sound as a dollar. Well, if you're, you're as sound as a dollar, then... Then why are you feeling so bad? Do you know the shape the dollar is in these days? <laughs> Costello, how does it feel to be a moron? It feels pretty good once you're used to it. Oh! <laughs> well, there's a sample of the high-grade nonsense you'll be hearing for the next half hour. But before we get back to it, listen to this. Stop hollering, Costello. <laughs> what is it? Costello, stop hollering. Where'd you get that black eye? Oh, I met Marilyn Williams at the country club, and she asked me if I'd like to play around with her. Yes? How did I know she was talking about golf? I... <laughs> you look terrible, Costello. I do? Yes. Well, I had a bad day, Abbott. When I left Marilyn, I ran into a tough guy with a gun. He said, give me your money or I'll blow your brains out. What did you do? I told him to blow my brains out. Why? In this town, you can get along without brains, but you got to have money. <laughs> well, never mind that. There was a phone call for you. Some, some girl from the Burbank Theater. Must be Rena LePoo. Rena LePoo, the bubble dancer. What a girl. She makes $1,000 a week. Oh, that's ridiculous. How can a bubble dancer make $1,000 a week? Big girl. Small bubble. I... <laughs> Does uh, Marilyn Williams know that you're running around with this bubble dancer? 
Oh, oh, sure. I told her, and she took her like a trooper. Like a trooper? A storm trooper. Uh, <laughs> well, now, don't be too hasty in giving up Marilyn. For Lena LePou, especially. No, Rini. Rini LePou. Rini, is it? She's French girl. Oh, French girl. Are you sure that uh, Miss LePou loves you? Oh, sure. Ever, she'd do anything for me. No she kidding. loves me so much that she goes out with other fellas so I can get the proper rest. <laughs> Uh, do you think you'll marry her? Nope. We got different ideas about marriage. She wants to have five boys, enough for a basketball team. Well, what's wrong with that? I'm a football fan myself. <laughs> you get so stupid. Tell me, is there, is there a school for morons? Oh, sure there's a school for morons. You mean you didn't know it? Uh, no, I didn't. Hmm, and all the time we thought you were playing hooky. I... <laughs> Costello, you'll be the death of me yet. What was that? I said, you'll be the death of me yet. Promises, promises. All I get is promises. <laughs> hey, you guys. You see a crazy man around here? Uh, what does he look like? He's a skinny guy. Three feet, two inches tall and weighs 520 pounds. Uh, just a minute, just a minute. How can he be skinny and weigh 520 pounds? I told you he was crazy! <laughs> Two to one, the sound guy's got the script upside down. Well, he's crazy. Hey, every week more crazy people come into this show. Last week, Abbott's wife walked in here with a rubber plant. Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter with my wife walking in here with a rubber plant? Growing out of her head? I... Norman, all right. What's the trouble? Well, you know that box of matches you gave me yesterday for my mother? Yes? Well, she can't light them. Well, here, give me the box. Now, I'll show you how to light them. Look, I just striked them on the seat of my pants. I know, but she can't wait for you to come over to the house every morning when she wants to light the stove. <laughs> Norman! <laughs> I got something for you, and I want you to keep it under your hat. What is it? A new head. Why don't you stop picking on Norman? Oh, why don't he get out of here and get himself a job? Norman, when I was your age, I was working in a store for $3 a week, and in five years, I owned the place. Yeah, but you can't do that nowadays, Uncle Louie. And why not? Now they've got cash registers. <laughs> that was Abbott's nephew, folks. And at the end of the season, we're going to send him to the Harvard Medical School in a bottle. <laughs> Norman is a brilliant student of history. Right now, he's studying about the Egyptian pyramids. What's that? Well, uh, they're great big things made out of concrete that uh, took thousands of men to build them. Hundreds of years to finish them, and by the time they were finished, they cost millions and millions of dollars. In Egypt, they call them pyramids. Uh, we got the same thing right here in California. Yeah? We call it the Hollywood Freeway. <laughs> Talking about pyramids, you see those cars on top of one another? Yeah, yes, I saw them. <laughs> Jokes, vinks, don't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I gotta go now. <laughs> I gotta go now. I got myself a new job. I'm with Phil Spitalny's All Girl Orchestra. Well, that's fine. <laughs> How do you get along with all the girls? Wonderful. He's got forty girls, and every night after rehearsal, I grab each one of them and I kiss her goodnight. You, wait a minute. You kiss forty girls? Are, aren't you overdoing it, Lou? Yeah, but if you saw these girls, you'd be overdoing it too. <laughs> Uh, what's your job with the orchestra, Lou? Well, I tell you, I'm in charge of the girls' cello section. I'm the head bender. Head bender? Yeah. Every night when they get through playing, I help get their legs back in shape. <laughs> well, isn't that dangerous work, Lou? Well, I'm used to dangerous work, Abbott. In the summertime, I'm a high wire walker in the circus. Uh, do you use a net? No, my hair is just naturally curly. I... <laughs> Have you ever had any other jobs working around women? Oh, yeah, in my spare time, I'm the intern at the movie studio. I, tr I treat stars when they get hurt or something. Well, oh, are you kidding? What do you know about first aid? Suppose, suppose a big star like uh, Rita Hayworth faded on the set. Now, how would you go about uh, reviving her? Well, I put my arms around her, and I hold her close, and then I smutter her with kisses. Well... What, what good would that do her? I don't know about her, but it sure would do wonders for me. <laughs> Hello, 
boys? Well, look, Costello, it's our singing star, Marilyn Williams. <laughs> Marilyn, I want you to know that we're very happy that you came over here from England to sing for our show. Uh, I, I think you're wonderful, Marilyn. Why, thank you, Mr. Abbott. In England, I was considered just another canary. A what? A canary. How do you like that? Over here, we got nothing but those little yellow ones. <laughs> What is that I smell? <laughs> it's a new perfume I'm wearing. It's called Roy Rogers Number no. 5. <laughs> Do you like it? <laughs> Why, yes. Hmm. Trigger comes through just as clear as a bell. <laughs> Marilyn, why don't you marry me? I'll take you away from all this. Oh, but I'm very happy, Lou. I have mink coats, diamond rings, automobiles, and thousands of dollars. Okay, then I'll take all this away from you. <laughs> don't pay any attention to him, Marilyn. Uh, why don't you let me take you uh, out over the weekend? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a date with a very sporty friend of mine, and if I go with him, he'll take me to the El Rancho Vegas and let me play roulette. If you go with Abbott, he'll take you to the La Brea Tar Pits and let you pitch pennies. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame Marilyn if she left this program and went back to England. You haven't done a thing for her since, since she's been with us, Lou. Oh, no? No. What about that lovely big present I sent you? You mean that manhole cover? Uh -huh. That was no ordinary manhole cover. <laughs> that one came from Beverly Hills. <laughs> Marilyn, uh, why don't you forget about Costello? I'm the man for you. You and I would get along together like ham and eggs. That's habit, folks. Always putting themselves first. <laughs> well, but I like both you and Lou, but I wish you'd both stop fighting over me. Marilyn's right, Costello. You fight over her like a dog fighting over a bone. Brother, when there's that much meat on a bone, I'll fight over it every time. Rough! Take it easy. Oh, let's forget about me, boys. How are you making out on your new picture? Wait till you see me in that picture, Marilyn. I play the part of a reckless gambler. I'm a big plunger. You're a what? A big plunger. Oh, that's fine. If our sink ever gets stopped up, I'll give you a call. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Costello. Uh, let's turn on the spotlight. Let's turn it on on our singing gal from England. Oh, that's great for us, and it's great for everybody listening. Here she is, folks, Marilyn Williams with Maddie Malnick's music. From the new Broadway musical, Where's Charlie? Here's a song I like. My darling, my darling, I've wanted to call you my darling for many and many a day my darling my darling i fluttered and fled like a starling my courage just melted away now all at once you kiss me and there's not a thing i'm sane enough to say except my darling my darling Get used to that name, my darling, it's here to stay. My darling, my darling, I've wanted to call you my darling for many and many a day. My darling, my darling, I fluttered and fled like a starling. My courage just melted away. Now all at once you kiss me And there's not a thing I'm sane enough to say Except my darling, my darling Get used to that name, my darling It's here to Yeah, but 
I just got myself a swell job. Washing the windows of the Coors Girls' dressing rooms at Earl Carroll's Theater. Some job. Washing windows of the Coors Girls' dressing room. What can you see in that? Plenty. After I get them clean? <laughs> my Uncle Mike got me the job. He's a pretty big man in this town. Your Uncle Mike is a nobody. Is that so? Well, last night, my Uncle Mike was invited to a big Hollywood sneak preview. But your Uncle Mike is not in pictures. Why was he invited to a big sneak preview? He's one of the biggest sneaks in town. <laughs> And he's, and he's also just like you, always broke. He is not. My Uncle Mike has a great reputation. He can walk into any bank in Hollywood. All he has to say is four words, and they give him all the money he wants. What are the four words? This is a stick-up. <laughs> no, I don't, see how your, I don't see how your Aunt May puts up with Mike. Well, they get along pretty good. I can't see it. Uncle Mike is the boss in this house. Aunt May runs the kitchen, and she tells the cook what to do. She tells the maid what to do, and she tells the gardener what to do. Mm, what about Mike? He can say anything he wants to the cat. <laughs> well, at least he's got some home life. Costello, why don't you find a nice woman that, that's the home type? I got one. Last night I said to her, let's go out for dinner. She said, no, Louis, I'll cook dinner for you. Then I said, how's about going to an iClub? And she said, no, Louis, we'll stay home and listen to the radio and save money. Oh, wait a minute. She sounds wonderful. Uh, where did you meet her? My father introduced me to her. Uh, what, what did he say? He says, Louis... This is your mother. I... <laughs> yeah, dummy, why don't you find a nice girl and, and ask her to marry you? I did have it. I asked that little blonde school teacher next door to marry me. Then what did she say? She said, ask my father. Well, did you ask her father? He didn't appeal to me. I... <laughs> oh, Mr. Cast... Mr. Costello, I've got a note for you here. Ah, <laughs> this time he beat the door in. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Costello. Ah! <laughs> Let him walk through the door. Oh, Mr. Costello, I got a note for you here. I'm not answering you. I like it the other way. You got a note for Costello? Uh, well, I take it, Lou. Who's it from, Lou? Uh, it's a fair note from one of my listeners. <laughs> it says, Dear Mr. Costello, your portrayal of Sam Shovel, private detective on the radio, is my favorite program. It's so funny that last week while listening to you, I simply died laughing. I'm coming to the studio tonight. I hope he gets in this time. He made it! <laughs> Mr. Costello, there's someone here to see you. Who is it? A corpse with a smile on his face. Have it a Sam Shovel in the I'm scaring half the people in the country to death. Well, what about the other half? The Thomas Committee will take care of them. Well, never mind that. What is your uh, Sam Shovel story for tonight? It's one of my most famous cases. I call it the case of the boy named Tony, whose mother kept him locked in a closet, or Tony's home permanent. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Well, let's get on with the case. Yes. Yes, I'm Sam Shovel, private detective. I'm sitting in my little office with my legs crossed. The hard way. The hard way. Behind my back. I'm sitting here typing a report on a famous criminal. Pulling the criminal out of the typewriter. <laughs> I turn to my desk and pick up a piece of paper. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. It's note paper. <laughs> I decide to clean out my desk and throw all the old bills into the wastebasket. That was my light bill. <laughs> that was the water bill. <laughs> that was just plain bill. <laughs> I glance down at the desk. There lies a full run of one of my early cases. The case of the murderess with the long golden hair. I made a lot of money out of that case. She was a beauty. I was dying to meet her. I spoke to her in Kansas City, but she gave me the brush. I tried to talk to her in Cleveland, but she gave me the brush. In Washington, she gave me the brush. In Buffalo, she gave me the brush. 
I never got acquainted with her, but I made a fortune selling her brushes. <laughs> it's about time for my pal, Lieutenant Amateur of the Homicide Squad, to show up. Every day he drops into my office to chew the fat. I wish Habit would stop chewing the fat. My arm is full of teeth marks. The door closed. <laughs> Hello, Sam. Sam Joe. That's Lieutenant Abbott. He's a brilliant man. He hasn't spoken for three pages. <laughs> now he comes on with a line bristling with humor saying, Hello, Sam Shovel. Sam. And you're in. Why do you stay cooped up here all day? Why don't you hire a typist to do your office work? I had a typist, Lieutenant, but I had to let her go. She could only type with one finger. Why? She had only one finger. <laughs> She came from a very poor family. She had nine thumbs. A typist with nine thumbs? Every time she hit that space bar, the typewriter jumped off the desk. <laughs> Any new cases today, Sam? Yes, a guy came in here this morning and told me he shot both of his aunts. He put six bullets in one of them and four bullets in the other. And he wanted my advice. Well, what, uh, what'd you tell him to do? I said, go home and get the lead out of your aunts. <laughs> Sam, I've got a case for you. The chief wants you to shadow strip tease Susie, the burlesque queen, and see if you can get something on her. What? Clothes. Do <laughs> you know uh, strip tease Annie or Susie or where is Susie? Do you know strip tease Susie, Sam? Doesn't matter who it is. I'll get it. <laughs> I saw her on the stage once. She came out to do her fan dance. A mouse ran out in front of her, and Susie dropped her fans. What happened? The mouse fainted. <laughs> well, forget about that case, Sam. How would you like to help me collect some evidence against Waterfront Lil? I think her cafe on the riverbank is a hangout for the smugglers, but I need more information. I'll help you, Lieutenant Abbott. I'll go down there with you. Hand me my fishing pole and that can of bait. What do you want with the bait? I'm going to worm the information out of her. I... <laughs> Sam, you're a tough detective. Waterfront Lil used to be your girl, and here, here you are ready to double-cross her. Yes, Lieutenant Abbott. I'm a detective through and through. Why, I double-cross my brother. Hello, Sam. Get out of here before I double-cross you. Who was that? My brother. <laughs> now, come on, Sam. We're going to Waterfront Lil's Cafe. toughest part of town, the hangout for tramps, cutthroats, and vagrants. Suddenly, the exciting odor of taboo perfume fills the waterfront air. I wonder where it's coming from. It's me. I'm covered with taboo perfume. Who are you? Oh, just a fragrant vagrant. <laughs> no matter what we give Abbott's nephew, he gets nothing. <laughs> Just a check every week. That's yes. all he gets. Hey, Sam, there's Waterfront Little Cafe over there. I don't like the looks of that place, Lieutenant. Why not? Sailor just come out of the door and he's walking down the street holding his girl's arm. Well, lots of sailors walk down the street holding their girl's arm. While the girl is still in the cafe. <laughs> we walked toward the cafe. Lieutenant Abbott was looking left and right. He has shifty eyes. He shifted him in a second. <laughs> Together we enter the saloon through the doors. They were swinging doors. <laughs> they were really swinging tonight. The place was full of tough mugs. A guy eight feet tall walked toward us. He was a longshoreman. He was a longshoreman. <laughs> I just got it myself. <laughs> we should read the script once in a while, Abbott. <laughs> he was the longest shoreman I ever saw. He took a punch at Lieutenant Abbott's chin. <laughs> Abbott has a glass jaw. <laughs> I wasn't going to stand there and let that man do that to my friend, Lieutenant Abbott. 
This man was eight feet tall, so I hit him with a left. I hit him with a right. I hit him with another left, another right. I knocked him down. Then I took his crutches away and broke his pencils. <laughs> I looked up. Waterfront Lil was standing beside me. She was more beautiful than ever. She spoke. Hello, Sam. Hello, Miss Waterfront. <laughs> Call me Lil, you gorgeous hunk of man. Okay, Lil, you gorgeous hunk of man. <laughs> Never mind the romance and Sam. You've got to find out if she's a smuggler. Okay. Be, be supple. Don't let her know you're after information. Okay. Take it easy. All right. Okay. Lil, are you a smuggler? <laughs> I'll tell you if you promise not to turn me over to the police. I'll promise you won't turn me over. Why should I turn you over? You can't look any better on the other side. <laughs> oh, Sam, you're so sweet. Come here, I'm going to give you a kiss that will take the curl out of your hair. Well, I... <laughs> Sam, Sam, speak to me. Lieutenant Abbott. Call up my mother and tell her I'm no longer a Tony twin. <laughs> well, Lil, we got you at last. I'm taking you in. Oh, no, you're not. You'll never take me alive. Quick, Sam, put the handcuffs on her. <laughs> she got me. I'm shot. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Quick, Lieutenant, call an ambulance. We'll take Sam to the hospital. No, no, not the ambulance. Sam, don't, don't, you, don't you want to go to the hospital? Yes, but I ain't riding in no ambulance through that Los Angeles traffic. A man can get killed that way. I'll walk. Oh, quick, get him out of here. It's all right, folks. Our madmen aren't through with you yet. Right now, they want you to hear this. Costello, you certainly gave a brilliant performance to Sam Shovel tonight. Thank you, Bud Abbott. You're full of pep. Yes, sir, you, you certainly were effervescent tonight. Did you ever see me when I effervescent? <laughs> effervescent. Now I know what happened to Baron Munchausen's writers. We've got them. Oh, good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Patterson. Good night. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Charles Vanda. And featuring Marilyn Williams and Matty Malnick and his orchestra. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on ABC stations. <laughs>